Hi, everybody, and welcome to this tutorial. My name is Jimena Fernandez. I'm from Durham University. I'm also a member of the UK Center of TDA. In this video, I'm going to present a new version of discrete mode theory that I call discrete mode theory 2.0. Let's focus on the following question. Is there any way to completely understand the homotopy type of CW complexes from its combinatorial structure? Recall that the CW complex is a nice topological space built with small pieces by an iterative process of attachment of cells of increasing dimension. The process of attaching a K cell to a space X can be thought as gluing a K dimensional disk to X through its boundary using some map called attaching map. This induces a map from the disk to this new space called characteristic map. And basically, a case cell is the image of the open disk over this map. Along the stack, we will use the usual notation EK for k dimensional cells. For instance, if we start with a point or a zero cell, if you attach a one cell, you obtain a circle. But if you attach a two cell, you will obtain a sphere. Now, if you start with a point, or you attach two cells of dimension one and then a cell of dimension two using this attaching map, you will obtain a torus. Notice that different attaching maps may give rise to different topologies. Now, the question is, is there any combinatorial method to simplify the CW structure of a complex without changing its homotopy type? Good news, the answer is yes. Suppose you're given a complex in which you can identify a pair of cells of consecutive dimension, EK and EK minus one, such that EK is maximal and EK minus one is attached in such a way to represent a free phase of EK. But what does formally mean? Well, the complex should be decomposed as a complex L and two cells whose attaching maps satisfy some specific conditions, but can be summarized in the fact that some part of the attaching map of EK induces the characteristic map of EK minus one, and the rest is attached to L. In this situation, we can remove the pair of cells EK and EK minus one performing an elementary collapse, and the inverse transformation is called elementary expansion. In any case, there is a strong deformation retract from K to L that in particular preserves the homotopy type. Let's apply these ideas in a concrete example. Let's start with this CW structure associated to a three-dimensional bond. We can identify a pair of cells to perform the first collapse. A3, the filling of the ball, and E2, one of the two cells of the cortex. We remove this pair of cells performing the first collapse. Then we repeat this process iteratively. Each time, we identify a pair of cells of consecutive dimension in such a way one of the cells is a free phase of the other. Every step of this process preserves the homotopy type of the original complex. So we have proved that this CW structure of a ball can be simplified to a point without changing its homotopy type. In particular, we proved that it's contractible. Now let's apply the previous procedure in this new example. This time, a CW structure of a two-dimensional sphere. We should identify a pair of cells to perform the first collapse. But did you find any? No, me neither. The problem is that we cannot even start to collapse because there are no free faces. We will make the following trick. We remove a two cell from the cortex, annotate that change, and then we're able to start the collapse. At this point, we follow the same strategy as before. After a sequence of several elementary collapses, we will end up again with a single point. Now, how to reconstruct the homotopy type of the original complex? Well, this Gridmore theory tells us that the original CW structure can be simplified into this new structure with a single cell cell and a single two cell that is a minimal structure of the sphere without changing its homotopy type. If you don't remember the details of classical discrete theory, don't panic. I will recall it for you. 
to come to the regular CW complex. The complex where the characteristic map of every cell is a homomorphism with its image. For example, satisfies this condition. And for instance, every simplicial complex is a regular complex. Then you need to construct the Morse function. That is a labeling of the cells of the complex in such a way that for every cell, the number of phases and cofaces for which the value of the function does not increase with the dimension is at most one. Here you have an example of the Morse function. If you don't believe me, you can pause the video and check that for every cell, for instance, the one in orange, the label of every phase and cofase respect the ordering given by the dimension with at most one exception. According to this labeling, a cell is says to be critical if the previous sum is exactly equal to zero. In other words, the labeling at this cell respect the ordering given by the dimension without any exception. In our example, the critical cells are marked in blue. The main theorem in this great more theory, proved by Robin Foreman in the 90s, says that given a regular complex K and a squared more function, it can be proved that K is homotopy equivalent to a reduced CW complex, sometimes called the Morse complex, with exactly one cell of dimension K for every critical cell of index K. In our example, the Morse complex has a single cell of dimension zero and a single cell of dimension two, which uniquely determines a two sphere. As you can see in the example, the explicit values of the Morse function are not so important, but instead the associated critical cells. An equivalent way to understand the role of Morse function is thinking about pairing the non-critical cells every time they don't satisfy the ordering imposed by the dimension. This generates a matching over the cells of K without cycles, and the critical cells are represented exactly by the non-matched cells. On the other hand, the critical cells of a Morse function determine a filtration of subcomplexes of K, in which at every step we have either a collapse of non critical cells or the deletion of critical cells. Each of the structures in the right is enough information to perform the simplification of K. Let's apply the theory in this example. That is an exon with the boundary identified according to the arrows. Can you determine its homotopy type? We will see if the Squidmore theory can help us. We start by determining some acyclic matching on the set of cells. Then match cells are the critical cells and are marked in blue. You can imagine if you want an underlying Morse function that determines this pairing. But as we said before, this is not strictly necessary. According to Forman theorem, this complex is homotopy equivalent to a new complex the structure has a single cell of dimension zero, two cells of dimension one, and a cell of dimension two. But which complex is that? Is it a wedge of circles and a sphere? Is it a torus? We should reconstruct the attaching map of the critical cells in order to completely determine its homotopy type. Let's try to understand better the process of construction of the most complex. At the beginning, since there is no free phase to start the collapse, we identify a maximal critical cell and remove it, changing the homotopy type of the complex. Then we start to perform the collapses. Now let's start again with a different strategy. Instead of removing the critical cell to perform the collapse, we perform the collapse internally, modifying the attaching map of the critical cell. But wait, how does it work? Imagine you're in the simplest situation when you have a complex K that collapses to complex L. Now, you attach a new cell to K that obstructs the previous collapse. Notice that you can also attach an induced cell to L after composing the original attaching map with a deformation retract induced by the collapse. How do these complexes relate each other? Well, there is always an intermediate complex with a new cell that is attached using the homotopy between the two characteristic maps and this complex collapse to both of the previous complexes. In particular, if the dimension of K is N, then there is an N plus one deformation between these two complexes. 
meaning that there is a sequence of expansions and collapses where all the complexes involved has a dimension up to n plus one. So we iterate this procedure in our original complex and we end up with a complex with one cell for every non-internally collapsed cell or equivalent for every critical cell. In the end, we could reconstruct the touching map of each cell. To sum up, we have proved that this complex freely forms to this new reduced complex, which is a torus. Here you have the statement of the refinement of Forman theorem that we have used in the previous example. You start again with a regular complex of dimension n and a discrete mode function. Then it can be proved that there exists a sequence of internal collapses that allows to explicitly transform k into a reduced complex with exactly one cell for each critical cell. Moreover, it can be proved that there is an n plus one deformation between the original complex and the Mars complex. In particular, we we'll recover its homogeneous type. For details of the proof, check the article in the bottom. As a bonus, I would like to show you how to apply these ideas to my progress in some problems in low dimensional topology. This is a question posed by Anderson Curtis in the 60s that is still open. It says that every contractible two complex really forms to a point. For instance, this is a very famous example of a contractible two complex that is called the dance hat. You can see that there's no free phase to start the collapsing. Indeed, it's necessary to expand it first in order to be able to perform any collapse. Seaman proved that the dance hat predeforms to a point in a very specific way, and he conjectured that this strategy should always work for every contractibility complex. However, this problem is also still open, and in general, it's not known how to obtain predeformations. Here's another example of a contractible complex of dimension two. In this case, it was not known if it's possible to simplify it to a point through a free deformation, being this a potential counterexample to the Andrews Curtis conjecture. Now, using the Scritmore theory, we can find a Morse function defined in its very centric subdivision. This is because we need the complex to be regular, and by the previous result, there is a free deformation between this complex and the Morse complex. It turns out that in many cases, the Morse complex predeforms to a point in a very easy way. And it's true in general that the two complex predeforms to its very centric subdivision. Putting all together, we have proved for the first time that this complex satisfies the Andrus Cardis conjecture. Again, for details of the proof, look at the article in the bottom. Here are some references on discrete more theory, and in general, on problems in low dimensional topology related to simple homotopy theory. Thanks for watching this video. If you have any comment or question, please leave it below the video, or feel free to contact me. Bye.